Hello, welcome to a talk on a specific class of Bohemian matrices. I'll be speaking from a Maple worksheet, actually a workbook which contains code. The uh, workbook can be found at the Maple Cloud. So just find the Maple Cloud and look for Bohemians and you will find this particular, well, something very like this worksheet. It's certainly the same uh, up until the very last section. I've given several talks on Bohemian matrices before. If you go to the website bohemianmatrices.com, you'll find links to some of those other talks and definitions. So if you want a general introduction of the area, that's where to look. This talk is going to be about a specific family and what we can learn from this one specific family. Uh, Here's why we're doing this. This is a, uh, an image, a density plot of eigenvalues for a particular class, a particular member of the uh, family that we're going to be looking at today. Not exactly that one. We're not going to exactly do that one, but we'll do, do some simpler ones. I actually really like this cartoon of John DePillis. He's at UCAL at Riverside, and he does lots of really interesting cartoons and fun cartoons. I like the fact that Bohemian matrices have cartoons. What is a Bohemian matrix? The most basic sense, a Bohemian matrix family is a set of matrices, all of whose entries come from a bounded set. The height of a matrix is the absolute value of the largest entry in the matrix. So, you know, it could be negative. Uh, the original intent of dealing with this kind of, this collection of families of matrices was uh, just to use integers, but in fact, they don't have to be integers. You can do other things as well. Anyway, that's where the name came from, bounded height matrices of integers. And it's a simple idea, and lots of matrices of this type occur in lots of different applications. But I, let's just look at these matrices as a class. All right, this is a useful specialization in the sense of polygon. That's a link to one of my talks, by the way. Okay, this Maple workbook. Let me try to make the commands a little bit more visible to people. Has Maple commands in it, and it has text and various other things in it. So when you download it, you can actually run and execute the code and change it and try and do the things that, that uh, you like. You can mess about with it. So that's, that's what we'll do a little bit here. Anyway, um, I'm going to skip a lot of this stuff here, but I will say that when I read in my code, my code is available over here on the left-hand tab in the workbook. You have the, the code. There's the, the programs contained in bohemianimages.maple are over there, uh, and you read that into the worksheet, and it says that there's a whole bunch of them that are predefined. Uh, the only one we're going to be using is this one, skew sim try. Skew symmetric tridiagonal matrices. And more than that, we're only going to allow the entries to be either one or i. Any of the, the non zero entries in there have to be one or i, and where i is the square root of minus one. All right, well, a, a tridiagonal matrix is very simple just three bands. A skew symmetric matrix means when you transpose it, you get the negative. So that means that the main diagonal entry must be zero because that when you transpose them, they don't move. Um, and it also, if it's tridiagonal, it means the sub-diagonal has got to be the negative of the upper diagonal. So once you specify the upper diagonal of a skew symmetric tridiagonal matrix, you know everything about it. Uh, here's some examples. So here's how you tell Maple to use lowercase i as the uh, square root of minus one. Um, and now the population is just going to be one and i. Now here's a generic matrix of this form. So you can see that we have uh, just the row of non-zeros above the diagonal, and then exactly the same entries appear as in the same order, but negated in the bottom. So a very simple class of matrix. And when we choose the entries to be one, one, and i, so I pass in a specific vector of uh, entries from the population, we get this. I will need the linear algebra package, so we load the linear algebra package, and we'll be concerned with eigenvalues and characteristic poly polynomials. This worksheet should be accessible 
uh, even to undergraduate students, by the way. The, the concepts that we're going to be looking at is just uh, eigenvalues and characteristic polynomials, and that actually links the definition. So even if people haven't seen eigenvalues or characteristic polynomials, it's still suitable. At the same time, we're going to get to some open problems. Okay, let's find the characteristic polynomial of that specific 4x4 four four matrix with uh, 1, 1, and i. And Maple says, sure, that characteristic polynomial is lambda to the fourth plus lambda squared minus 1. And if we want the eigenvalues, the traditional way is to solve the characteristic polynomial. So if we solve it with f solve in uh, Maple, then it says, oh, sure, no problem. There, you have uh, a real root a purely imaginary root, a purely imaginary root, and a real root. Great. Now, if instead we say find eigenvalues of that uh, specific 4x4 four four matrix, it returns the same numbers, or almost the same numbers, in a different order. And of course, the two sets of numbers are supposed to be exactly the same, but they were computed in two different ways. In the second way, instead of solving a polynomial equation, we actually invoked a, a numerical eigenvalue solver. Uh, so one would expect that the, new, the numbers aren't exactly the same, but at least the imaginary part to this one is the digits are exactly the same, but here we've got some clearly some round-off error in the real part here, um, and we have some round-off error in the imaginary part here, but no round-off error in the imaginary part for this one, so it's a little bit odd that you get numerical behavior that's uh, different, but it's okay. If instead we worked in 50 digits, the computation would take longer, but we would get uh, increased agreement between the numbers that were computed in these two different ways. Methods are still different. Uh, both methods are more or less equally fast. Well, actually, eigenvalue is about 10 times faster, but it's not. that's not important. It's, uh, 31 milliseconds and uh, and 15 milliseconds at, at 50 digits and then the at the at the 15 digit once about 10 times faster but it doesn't matter we did not use the analytic solution of the characteristic polynomial and this is a degree four uh, polynomial and so one would expect a very ugly set of answers but in fact it's not so ugly and that's because this particular p is actually quadratic and lambda squared so you can solve it with a quadratic and take square roots so that's easy all right that's the background eigenvalues characteristic polynomials solve the eigenvalues with the eigenvalue root, uh, routines qr iteration you get slightly different answers than if you solve polynomials great here's the image that we're going to build I have lost track of how I did the colors for that one, but I like the colors for that one, so I, I made the image. This is an image of a density plot of eigenvalues in the complex plane. So the real axis is horizontal, imaginary axis is vertical as usual. We're going to start small. The dimension is 7. We compute with ordinary double precision numbers, so digits equals 15 in maple. Uh, population is 1 and i, the family is the skew symmetric tridiagonal matrices, and if we make a generic one of these things, uh, there it is. There's a, a 7 by 7 skew symmetric tridiagonal matrix where the, the entries are taken from some population where the u's can only be either 1 or i. Great. How many uh, possible matrix entries are there? There's six. We get six entries to choose from so the total number of matrices is just going to be two to the six or 64 so there's 64 different matrices of that kind uh, we could list those all by hand but in fact the code that i wrote uses a, an iterator in the iterators package and it's rather good uh, and so that will just cycle through all the possible ways of writing or choosing uh, u1 through u6, and we can compute all the possible eigenvalues. So I make all of those matrices, all 64 of those matrices, and I compute all of the eigenvalues for all of those things, and I put those in a vector called rtvec7. That took a th third of a second, approximately. 
and we can just use plots complex plot to plot those things to make it easy i wrapped up a bunch of base, uh, default options i wanted the color black and i wanted this the point the, the style to be point with different uh, smaller size of points but anyway there you go there's the the uh, all of the eigenvalues of all 64 7 by 7 matrices with entries u1 through u6 being either one or i it seems perfectly reasonable to, uh, the eigenvalues have some kind of pattern we'll come back to this let's try a larger dimension with the same population let's try m equals 15. So RTVEC 15 is, again, get all of the eigenvalues of every single member of that family. Now there's 16,384 different matrices in there, and each of those matrices has 15 eigenvalues. So that means there's rather a lot of eigenvalues to plot. So if I tried to do a basic plot, uh, I'd get a really ugly thing. Don't do it. Well, you can if you want, but don't say I didn't warn you. But we've got to do something different. So we choose an 800 by 800 grid, for example, on a square centered at the origin of width 4. And you can experiment with the width and try and decide whether that's enough or too much or whatever. And we make a density plot of the eigenvalues. So we're going to divide that plane up into 800 by 800 collection of boxes, and we're going to count the number of eigenvalues that land in each box. Uh, OK, that's what this does. We have. Uh, get image data from the vector of eigenvalues that some what have we got uh, 245,760 different eigenvalues and it walks through each one of those and decides which box to put a, a count in so it increases the count of whatever there are and I maxed out the count at two, 256 because I'm only going to color it with 256 colors at most all right, so the maximum count in the image data, well, it actually reached the maximum, so I don't know how much more than 256 it was, but we have at least 256. I want to use a trick. I want to count. I want to have the higher counts should get a hotter color. So I used the statistics package to count the relative frequency, and you see that uh, the number of, of pixels that have only one uh, eigenvalue in them is 540. The number of eigenvalues that have two, number of pixels that have either, have two eigenvalues in it exactly is about 29,000 pixels. So there's a lot more of them that have two than have one. Then there's not so many that have three, and but lot, lots 5,602 at four. So there's going to be a little bit of uh, bias towards um, even numbers of, of counts. But to make the equitable, equitable color plot, we just use the statistical information. And uh, this is what the, the frequency distribution looks like. So we're going to use that for the, uh, the cumulative distribution, uh, I mean, it looks like. So we're going to range the colors from uh, this indigo purple kind of thing up to yellow. And we're using the Veritas color map, and I'll talk about the Veritas color map if I like, if I have time. Um, it's a nice map for a bunch of reasons developed by these guys for Python. I have a link to their videos where they describe how they built the map, and it's really a nice video. Uh, so you can have a black background or a white background. Uh, we're going to use black at least to start with. And the hottest color is going to be the top color, that, that yellow, is that, that'll happen when there's so many eigenvalues that we reach 256 on there. All right, so then we just map all of the colors into uh, the counts so that if you have a high count, then you get a hot color. And we put the color data into the color array. And now we colorize the image. So we have this. 800, 800 by 800 grid with numbers in it and now we take if the, the, the number is large then we get a hot color and there it is there is the uh, uh, all of the eigenvalues of 
every 15 by 15 matrix that is skew symmetric, tridiagonal, and has population as either one or I. Okay, so that's two to the 14th different matrices, and each of them is dimension 15. So that's a lot of eigenvalues. But as you can see, there is a very definite pattern here. We can see really hot lines along the axes. There's a lot of real eigenvalues. There's a lot of purely imaginary eigenvalues. There's empty spaces. There's places here where there's no eigenvalue. And we see a curious phenomena in the middle. It looks like a little flower. And when I first saw one of those little flowers, I said to uh, my student who had produced the flower, I said, hmm, is that picture correct? Are we looking at eigenvalues or are we looking at something else? And it turns out uh, that there's a feature in that plot which is due entirely to, rot to floating point effects. Uh, that's rounding error. That feature is not there if dimension is not 15 but it's 16. And it's not there if the dimension is not 15 but 14. Okay, and I have a proof, which is what I'll be talking about in the second half of this uh, talk, that this phenomenon only happens at dimension 2 to the k minus 1 for some k. It actually happens at dimension 1, but it's trivial at dimension 1, so you don't really see it. No, in fact, it doesn't happen at m equals 1. Sorry. It could have if m was bigger than 1, but it anyway. Trust me on this one. Uh, so m equals 14. Now here, if we rotate the population, so the population is not 1 and i anymore, but if you just rotate that so that it's 1 plus i over root 2 or 1 minus i over root 2, they're still at 90 degrees to one another. Um, pardon me, 90 degrees this way. All what that does is we'll rotate the picture of eigenvalues. So instead of being a, a diamond shape, it's a square shape. And so let's just we run all the same code for all of the same things. And now we have a square shape. And as you can see, there's no little flower in the middle. We still have the lines of lots of eigenvalues aligned in the direction of the, uh, uh, the nodes. 1i in the previous case, 1 plus i over root 2, and 1 minus i over root 2 in the, in the other case. So there's holes around those points and a big hole in the middle with lots of scallop shape. Lots of interesting puzzles about the shape that's coming up in here. But let's first concentrate on that. Um, oh yes, we could play here. If you take the negative of the, the image, then you get the same thing, but with different colors. It's kind of fun to, to do that sort of stuff. Let's look at that flower in the middle. Go back to the m equals 7 case, the simple one. It looked okay, but there was a black dot in the center. If we zoom in so that now we're looking at a box of size plus or minus 1 over 100, uh, then we see not a solid black dot, but a kind of rosette, the kind of same kind of flower that we saw in the m equals 15 case. Then you look at that for a while, and then you see, wait a minute, that bit in the middle that looks like there's a five-fold symmetry so that same as that same as that same as that same as that and okay five-fold and then you look carefully up here and you see a seven-fold symmetry it's hard to see the seven-fold symmetry because we're not really used to seven but once you do see it you go yeah okay so these two guys together form a pair there's another pair there's another pair, 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 there's seven pairs. Then in between them, there are these other two wide apart pairs. Again, there's seven of them. So there's seven-fold symmetry there. Huh. Wow, we like symmetry. Um, turns out that the only kind of symmetry that's allowable is the fourfold symmetry. We can have uh, negation and conjugation, which will give us the, the uh, fourfold symmetry. And that's the only kind that's allowed. Well, I'll give you a proof of that in a minute. 
So what we're looking at here must be rounding error. And look at the size of it, plus or minus one over 100. We're working in 16 decimal digits. So something is very strange here. Uh, and there's that symmetry when you zoom in even more. Uh, it's it's uh, fabulous that you see symmetry and I claim that that symmetry is rounding error. So what's going on? Well, let's stop doing work with eigenvalues and go back to work with characteristic polynomials. So here's a uh, code in the Bohemian images saying, oh, I don't need to look at this anymore. Uh, that gets all the characteristic polynomials and it counts uh, the number of times that a given characteristic polynomial uh, occurs and it'll return a matrix representation. In fact, I say get all reps here, so all matrix representations for that one particular characteristic polynomial because there are some matrices in this collection that have the same characteristic polynomial. There are other matrices even if they don't have the same characteristic polynomial, they might share um, <coughs> eigenvalues. So here's uh, two sets of uh, parameter values which will give this uh, characteristic polynomial. And Boom, boom. There's sort of the characteristic polynomials. Yes, the same polynomial appears twice for these two different matrices. And the matrices are different. Down here we've got one and one. Here we've got one and i. So we have two different matrices that have the same characteristic polynomial. Okay. That's, that's normal. Let's look at uh, the characteristic polynomial lambda to the seventh. So that means that all of the eigenvalues will be zero. And it turns out that occurs, that characteristic polynomial occurs four times when m equals seven. Uh, and here are the four matrices. I just, uh, uh, I asked for the, the representations of the polynomial with all zero coefficients except for one. And it gave me these four collections of parameters. And when we make the, matrices, you get I1, I1, 1I, I1, 1I, 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 I1, I1, 1I, 1I, I1. And all of those have characteristic polynomial lambda to the seventh. Convert that to a set. See, yep, there's, there's no difference there. And it is these matrices which generate the spurious eigenvalues with the sevenfold symmetry. All of the eigenvalues of each of these four matrices is zero. If we ask F solve to solve this one, we just get zeros. But if we try to compute the eigenvalues of these matrices numerically, then the rounding errors seriously interfere. Multiple eigenvalues are Holder continuous, but not Lipschitz continuous. And this means they're numerically awkward to compute. Great. Uh, here's the eigenvalues of those matrices, bang, 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 and we plot them all and there you've got the sevenfold symmetry again. Once the symmetry is noticed, we can get all our accuracy back, just average. Take the arithmetic mean of these things and all the rounding errors go away and we've got just machine epsilon there. You can do the same thing for the threefold and the fivefold zeros. It's a little bit more awkward to do that, but you can. You can find uh, the matrices where, which give you all the fivefold eigenvalues and so on. I'm just going to skip over that because what I want to get to is a proof that these are the only cases. So just to check the uh, uh, case m equals 15, we have uh, this population boom and I claim that this is, well, no, I don't claim, I computed that the only matrices uh, which give you the characteristic polynomial lambda to the 15 are these ones, and there's eight of them. There were four of them at m equals seven, and there are eight at m equals 15. Well, if we plot them, we have 
pardon me, 15 fold symmetry, which nobody can see. Look at the size, uh, plus or minus one tenth. So we're working in double precision and 15 by 15 matrix is not very big. And we've got rounding errors on the size of 0.1. So this is really surprising for computing eigenvalues. People are just not used to eigenvalues not being as accurate as, as they should be. Uh, but the averages of those things are, are just fine. So the same kind of thing has happened at m equals 15 has happened at m equals 7. And I'm going to skim over uh, all of the computations with uh, uh, GCD and all of these other kinds of things to get to uh, the place where we can start proving things. So one of the things you can prove is the characteristic polynomials of each of these matrices has a very simple form. So they satisfy the simple recurrence. P0 equals 1, P, P1 equals lambda. So the 1 by 1 matrix has characteristic polynomial lambda minus 0. That, okay, great, easy. Uh, P0 equals 1 is a convention, but it, it actually works with, uh, with this one. And you can prove by Laplace expansion about the bottom corner do Laplace expansion about lambda minus this matrix about the bottom corner, then you can say that PM plus 1 is lambda times PM plus UM squared times PM minus 1. And now PM depends only up to UM minus 1, and PM minus 1 only depends up to UM minus 2. So the only place that UM appears is here, the UM, and it appears to the squared. So that means there's no difference between 1 and minus 1 in the population, and there's no difference between i and minus i in the population. So that explains our D4 symmetry. Uh, when you do characteristic polynomials with the symbols in it, you see that we have these uh, possibilities for the uh, characteristic polynomial. So if u1 is i, then this will be a negative. And if u3 is i, that'll also be negative, so that'll be positive. It's, and all of that sort of stuff. We'll be able to work out some things from knowing how these characteristic polynomial uh, is going to work. All right, open questions. We're arriving at the last 10 minutes or so of the talk, and there are open questions. I'm going to close one of them, though. So here's a nice image, and I'll explain what that image is. Uh, is used for in a, in a minute. I, I like that matrix, that, that image. Um, oh yes, I should mention Maple Transactions. So we will be launching Maple Transactions officially uh, at the CMS summer meeting in June, but Maple Transactions is a new open access scholarly journal for uh, excellent expositions of topics of interest to the Maple community. There'll be no page charges for authors and there'll be no charges for uh, readers. So here's some open questions. Well, I answered number one and that's what I'll talk to you about in the last 10 minutes of the talk. So the, the one that I've solved and I'll prove is that there are nilpotent matrices only for dimensions one less than a power of two. Uh, and I have completely characterized them. So we have, we have exactly uh, 1 at m equals 1. We have exactly 2 at m equals 3. We have exactly 4 at m equals 7. We have 8 at uh, m equals 15, and so on. Uh, okay, how do, how do we prove that? Well, here's some more open questions. How many matrices at each dimension have multiple eigenvalues? How many have multiple zero eigenvalues? So that means the dimension is odd, that's easy, but uh, counting the number of matrices with multiple zero eigenvalues, don't know how to do that. Why is the shape of the set of eigenvalues as it is? If you take random dense matrices, then their eigenvalues tend to fill uh, a disk. It's a scale disk. If it's dimension 10, then the width is, is typically about uh, um, square root of 10, about 3. And if the dimension is, is 64, then the, the dimension is about 8. But that, that's fine. Here, we don't get circles. We get these funny diamonds. Okay, I don't know why. Uh, 
what about the holes? I have partial explanations for some of the holes. There are people who talk about uh, what are called algebraic starscapes, and they explain some of the finer features of, of these, uh, including a little bit about the holes. But in general, the explanation is not understood. Can we get nice bounds on those exclusion zones, which will vary from family to family? And the same and similar questions are open for many other classes of Bohemian matrices, but they're open for this one. So this says acknowledgments and references, and it looks almost like I've finished the talk, but no, I have a proof to give to you, or at least a sketch. What I'm gonna to prove to you is that uh, the characteristic polynomial, which is just lambda to the M with no other terms present, can only happen at uh, M equals two to the K minus one. So the key is to look at uh, other dimensions for a moment. Here we've got u1 squared. Well, u1 is either one or i. u1 squared is either plus one or minus one. So that, that I don't care. At dimension two, there's no possibility for a nilpotent matrix. Dimension three, well, we can because we've got u1 squared minus u2 squared or plus u2 squared. Uh, and if one of these is plus one, uh, then the other can be i and you can have that coefficient be zero. And that's exactly what we saw. So one or an i at the uh, uh, dimension three, and that was good. Here, we have u1 squared times u3 squared, Well, there's no way that term can be zero. And there's no way this term can be zero either because there's three of them. And you can't take three copies of plus or minus one and add, make them up, add up to zero. So here we've got four copies, here we've got three copies of plus or minus one. There's no way we, this one could, and it turns out that just counting in this way is enough to get us a long way towards that. So we count the number of operations, number of operands in each of those things, and we get some nice polynomials here. So uh, at one, we just got lambda. At two, we've got lambda squared plus two, uh, lambda cubed plus uh, two lambda, and so on. These are known polynomials. These are Fibonacci polynomials, which are very simply related to Chebyshev polynomials of the second kind. <coughs> oh, the counts? Oh, yeah. Here I used NOPS, which counts the number of operands, and it gave me a two here. I was just looking at that now, I hadn't realized. That was because uh, in the case n equals two, it counts the operands of not of a sum, but a product. And there's two elements of the product. So NOPS isn't the quite, quite the right thing at, at that level, but it does give me all the right things later. So that one is wrong, but all right. This is, these are the correct set of polynomials, uh, which count the number of terms at each term. And these have known coefficients. They are binomial coefficients binomial m minus k comma k. So they don't fix the upper limit and march away. In fact, we if we start at k equals zero, so we start uh, down here at uh, m equals something, and for when we increase k, we move in this way and we move up because m is now decreased. And so we go in and up all the time. So we're gonna have to follow this funny slope uh, in the Pascal's triangle to get these these numbers. Now, if any one of these coefficients has an odd number of terms, so if any of these things is an odd number, then there's no way you can have all coefficients zero with this choice of population. So this is actually well known. We have Coomer's theorem. We had, there's this lovely paper of Andrew Granville uh, called Zaphod Beeblebrox's Brain and the 59th row of Pascal's triangle. So I point you at there. Those are, those are great stuff. So here we just need to figure out which sequences of binomial numbers of this form contain all even numbers. And these are gonna be the only possibilities for nilpotent matrices. And as I said, this happens only when m equals two to the j minus one. So here's just trying them all out. I take binomial m minus k, k mod two, as k goes from one to the floor of m over two, and I get all these zeros here. So here's, this shows right up to m equals 31 that at least the theorem is true. Now let's do something that we know. We know uh, the parity pattern of 
uh, binomial coefficients. If we just do Pascal's triangle mod two, so one and one add together, you get two, well, that's zero. Uh, one and zero, you add that, you get one. One and one, you get zero. One and one, you get zero. One and one, you get zero. Uh, one and zero, you get one. Uh, zero and zero, get zero, and so on. So we have this absolutely beautiful pattern with triangles of zeros uh, bounded by lines of ones. And we want to have one of these lines going up, so in and up, that never hits a one. So we want to have a, a way of, uh, okay, there's one, in and up, we get a zero, in and up, we get a zero, in and up, we get a zero, so there's one. And that's actually the case, uh, so that's the case of uh, m equals uh, three, so that works. Uh, this one is, oh, it's hard to count in here. What I really want to do is show you, uh, this one is a little easier. So if we go down and over, it's not the next one, it's down and over, and down and over. It's a little easier if the, the, the triangle is tilted over so that one side is vertical. But down and over, and down and over. So if we follow a line of that slope, and we hit all zeros, that's good. And the easiest way to convince yourself that this is actually a correct thing is to write this out on paper and take a ruler and draw a line at the correct slope. And in every case, except when you're starting at one less than a power of two, you will hit at least one one on that, on that way up. Now I've actually written this all up as algebra rather than waving my hands with Pascal's triangle picture, but we do have to not just have in one triangle, we have to actually go right through a sequence of triangles. So, all right, that's good enough, we can do that. That's a necessary condition. But only those powers can have all zeros. The question is, is it sufficient? And the answer is, yes it is, and we can exhibit all of the possibilities. So when m equals three, we have one i and i and one. Both of them have uh, uh, characteristic polynomial lambda cubed. And when you square the matrix, you don't get zero. And when you cube the matrix, you do get zero. So that's nice. Characteristic polynomial is, as you see, lambda cubed. Now, here's all the four by, uh, all the four matrices at those, all oh, four matrices at those dimensions, those are the only two nil potents. So now let's consider m equals seven. So now we have six possible parameters. Let's look at 1i, 1i, i1, 1i, i1, i1. So the trick is I've got 1 and i, and then I'm choosing 1 and i, and i and 1 in the middle, and then the i and the 1 at the end are the reversal of the 1 and i at the, at the front. So I've chosen something, the 1 and i, I put in the, the two new things, and then I reverse the last ones. And if you uh, do one I and then reverse the one in the middle, I1 and I1. It turns out that L1 and L2 are the reversals of one another, but that's okay. Uh, L3, now we start not with one I, but I1, I1, one I, and then the reversal of I1, which is one I, and then we do I1, I1, and the reversal, which is one I, and those give us four possibilities, and all four of those are nilpotent. And the pattern is just exactly what I was trying to say. If you have a sequence such that the previous two to the k minus one matrix is, is nil potent, then you can take those same parameters and you can build a new set of parameters for the bigger matrix, which will give you another nil potent matrix. You take that same sequence, and you put one in I, and then you reverse the sequence. And you take that same sequence and you do i and one and you reverse that sequence. So for each one at the previous level, you get two at, at this level. So that means the number of nilpotent matrices are going to double every time. Uh, and there it goes. So that is not too hard to prove that these that these patterns always work. You have this recursive structure and, and the, the proof is actually fairly straightforward. I don't have a nice proof that this is the only possible ones. 
I do have a proof that these are the only possible ones, but it involves actually going ahead and computing the uh, uh, Jordan blocks uh, of this thing, and you wind up, you've got, you have to have a vector uh, which is missing every part, and the next one, you're, you're flipped. So you, where you had a one before, you got a zero, and, and where you had the non-zero, you have a zero, and where you had a zero, you have a non-zero. So you have this pattern of holes coming in, and that carries you halfway to the matrix, the generalized eigenvalues of that, and then it starts giving you triangles up here. And in fact, it's exactly that Sierpinski gas matrix that I gave. So I, I like how pretty that looks. I don't like how ugly the, the algebraic work is to get there. So there's these two theorems that say that every nilpotent has a parameter vector of this sort, and every nilpotent has one full Jordan block. Uh, right now, my, my proofs are kind of ugly. And I've run out of time so that I can't give you any more details of this part of the proof, which is actually kind of nice. But at least I think you can believe me that because we've got this recursive structure, that if we can, uh, if we have nil potents at the, at the lower dimension, then we can have nil potents at this, at this dimension. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you very much for listening. And all of the references and all of the acknowledgments are in the file which is available on the Maple Cloud. Thank you very much.